All right, so we want to begin thinking a little bit through Brave New World. Uh, I really want to create some sort of uh, brief connection to each of the chapters as we read through them and as we think about them and sort of trying to help you think about some things that you should be picking up as you read. Um, so uh, this isn't really a summary. Uh, there's there's no real summary here. There will be, we will be talking about plot events that do happen, but more about an analysis of why those things are happening, what Huxley is trying to accomplish through some of those things, and also what we as readers should be picking up uh, in, in this analysis. Um, so in chapter one, uh, you begin with the students that are trailing the director and they're obediently writing down everything he says uh, and it sort of demonstrates how orderly and controlled the system is. Uh, we actually really begins with wanting to show you that that people are as organized as sort of the factory line that they are framing their entire society around. So with obvious pride, you know, the, the director sort of illustrates all of his different influence and leadership and he, he personally takes charge of each new group of students and you know there's evidently a real human element to the director which is a sense of irony that sort of developed right away in chapter one as he's showing how organized and non singular or non focused on the individual the society is yet we see he's very self uh, self prideful and focused. Uh, right away, we get to understand uh, the Bokanovsky process uh, that is used for producing embryonic budding. And it's obviously this point of pride with the director. Uh, he says, Oh, you really know where you are for the first time in history. And then he starts talking about. Uh, that if they could, if they could uh, Bokanovsky indefinitely, the whole problem would be solved, which is very ironic because it's the idea of identity, right? Which which comes from a sense of self. Now, now it comes from a feeling of oneness with no less than ninety five other identical beings. Um, so there's a real sense of irony to his statement. Uh, there's. We learned that the, that the date is AF 632, and it has not been really clarified yet, but the emphasis is on the idea of the assembly line production of people, um, and it gives a clue to the meaning of the F, the practice of the assembly line production in factories. Uh, and that was basically only about 15 years old when this novel was written. Um, but today's reader is so accustomed to the idea of the assembly line production that this point almost goes unrecalled. Uh, I do want you to think about, even in our contemporary society, how much stress there is on people that are having to work in assembly lines, uh, especially, you know, a, a media attention has been brought up to Apple uh, and their assembly line processes in China and the mental health that a lot of their workers have to go through. So even now in contemporary society, there's still a lot of ethical dilemmas about this process and how it sort of dehumanizes people. Um, so the official sterile statistical ease with which the director and Henry Foster uh, refer to human pr uh, production and population control also conjures up the image of uh, places like Detroit where you have these huge auto manufacturing plants uh, and sort of this the description of a truck or a car being put together. In fact, even at one point, the director casually compares the developing fetuses with developing film. In other words, they're only so tolerant, they're tolerant only of red light and and sort of just that sense of development and with a with a product with a with turning it into a commodity um the director and foster also refer briefly to the failures and although there's no references to whether these failures were destroyed it seems safe to speculate that probably the destruction of unacceptable specimens is probably an integral role of the assembly line process now uh 
Huxley does not touch it with the 10-foot pole. He only hits it from sort of an indirect stance. But this idea of probably termination it is sort of indirectly related and, and is in there. The students under the wings of the director are also all male, and they're all primary alpha characters in the novel. Uh, all the primary alpha characters in the novel are, of course, male as well. And that sort of illustrates the paternalistic society with men making decisions and determining the destiny of the new world and its inhabitants. This is a patriarchal society still. Yeah, it's all about community, stability. Really? Well, where's the equality? There is not an actual equality there. Men are still, still in control. Uh, chapter two, we begin with the talk about uh, Pavlov's study. Uh, and so in the 1920s, you know, Ivan Pavlov initiated the systematic study of condition responses and their implications for uh, psychology. Yeah, this is where we call what we call classical conditioning. And that's the learning situation that causes a response to a stimulus different from the usual or expected one. Pavlov, remember, performed the well-known experiment with a dog. And what he would do is he would take these dogs, tie them up, and the, he would make them salivate uh, when they smell food, right? So, so dogs salivate when they smell food. He would ring a bell each time he offered food to the dog. After a repetition of this pattern, Pavlov rang the bell, but he didn't offer food, and the dogs would still salivate. This is what we call a conditioned response. The process can also be used for counter-conditioning to get rid of unwanted behavior. Pavlov's experiments became well-known uh, and were often repeated to see uh, what humans could learn or unlearn with conditioned responses. So, lacking the ability to, to impose genetic uniformity on embryos, the rulers of tomorrow's over, overpopulated and overorganized world seemed that they were going to try to impose some sort of social and cultural uniformity upon adults and their children. And to achieve this end, they will, unless they're prevented, make use of all the mind-manipulating techniques at their disposal and will not hesitate to reinforce these methods, methods of non-rational persuasion by economic coercion and threats of physical violence. This is something that Huxley truly believed, and now we see it being used consistently. We call this psychological warfare manipulation. Look at the amount of non-free press in many countries throughout the world. Even the U.S. and certain things definitely leave certain particular ideas classified, or uh, you can see that even you know on the Internet certain things are taken off. And, and there may be a point where certain things are needed to be taken off, but the, it does ask us the question or has, have us ask the question of how are we being manipulated, right? How are we being manipulated and are we being conditioned to think about certain things? And I'm less concerned with really about the way governments do it. I do think that they do it. I mean, absolutely. But also look at things like advertisement and marketing and how those sort of mind manipulating techniques are really being used uh, to the common consumer. Also, classical experiments have also shown that a process called extinction occurs when the conditioned stimulus, like the bell, uh, was pre uh, repeatedly presented without unconditioned stimulus, like the food. Uh, however, the conditioned response of fear seems to continue years after the initial incident, even without reinforcement. Childhood fears can last far into adulthood, when the person may have long forgotten the incident. Fear-producing events in adulthood can also linger, causing a conditioned response to which many war veterans could attest. Uh, and this is where the director talks about the fable of Ruben Rabinovich, um, and he uses that fable to demonstrate the advances that have been made in the 600 years since Ford. He can resist some sort of, he doesn't, and he doesn't resist talking about the titillating experiences of what family relationships used to be and how women used to get pregnant. And it basically takes what was the family relationship and the idea of intimacy and turns it into a sort of a type of pornography almost, or a sort of smut for, as he talks to the students about it. Um, and this is also why Huxley really uh, focuses on the idea of uh, fear producing events uh, with these children that, that are being born and uh, as we see with like the flowers and the, the electrocution and the you know things like that so the shocks so uh, we see that consistently um, and uh, Huxley seems to be right on point with that um, even though a lot of the, the, the testings there weren't 
complete at the time that Huxley wrote it. Now we see how just right on he was with such a situation. Now in chapter three, this chapter really employs the kind of quick cross-cut scenes that we actually see in films a lot. Um, and it, it wasn't seen a lot in when Huxley writes this, but there's this sort of quick cutting scene between the student group listening to uh, Mustafa Mond and the changing room of the hatchery. Now, Tuxley does this because the reader needs the scientific data of the new world, but he also wants there to be this sort of literary technique of virtually making the reader one of the students. And this also allows Huxley to explain the science he's created while he's embedding the beginning of the narrative that's happening. So the controller is using the most vivid and to the students disgusting terms to describe the old family way of life in the old world. But after bathing, Lenina and, and Fanny talk. And Fanny says that she has not been feeling well and has been advised to have a pregnancy substitute, even though she's only 19. She shows Lenina the chemical hormones she has to take. And both are very matter of fact about the whole thing. Fanny is actually also very surprised that Lenina is still seeing uh, Henry Foster. Um, and she reminds Lenina that four months with the same man would possibly upset the director. Remember, long relationships are unacceptable. They are all about the openness of the relationship and the culture. So she advises Lenina to have uh, more of a promiscuous stance and um, to, to, to sleep with a lot of other men, uh, as well as Foster. And even though Fanny admits that she likes, uh, that she liked Lenine and doesn't always feel like going from man to man, they must conform to social standards. Now, Huxley does kind of put that in there and he, he has us asking, you know, well, what is the natural inclination here? Is, you know, a lot of people uh, suggest that monogamy is not a natural inclination um, because there's this biological urge to spread the seed or whatever evolutionary but then he says but isn't there also this 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 need for intimacy or closeness to be known in a community with people people are more than just their primal instinct uh, and so we see some of that coming out here in chapter three uh, as there's sort of this conversation happening now, in the men's dressing room, Henry Foster and a co-worker are casually discussing Lenina. Uh, the term pneumatic is used to describe anything wonderful or anyone who's sexually attractive and capable. And so Bernard Marx overhears the two and becomes infuriated at the way they refer to Lenina. He equates it to making her a piece of meat. Um, and then it goes back, and Fanny is shocked to hear that Lenina... Uh, talks about Bernard with interest. She's heard that he actually likes to be alone and she thinks he's shorter than alpha height, which means something is wrong with him. And so this, the scenes quickly move back and forth. Mon lists the terrors of destruction of the pre-modern world. Fanny and Lenina engage in girl talk about men and clothes. Bernard becomes increasingly more upset as he listens to Henry's discussion of women, uh, especially with Lenina and sex. And then intertwined with these three scenes are the sleep repetitions being done in the conditioning center that urges all towards community identity stability and the sort of consumptive consumerism. So there's this effect. We see the effect of this consumptive consumerism uh, with different people, uh, Fanny and Lenina, and then of course uh, Bernard and uh, Henry in, in that discussion. And you see that it's not all it's cracked out to be, but yet, Huxley isn't writing in such a way that makes you hate it. He's he's writing in a way that inclines you to question some of the ideas that are that are going on and and not to just dismiss but to think through them. And and so it's a very interesting chapter. It's a really well written chapter, uh, and it was pretty uh, unprecedented for that time period. Those quick, quick cross cross cutting scenes. Um, so pretty interesting. Uh, at the end of the chapter, Controller Mond ends his lecture with a reference to Soma. Now, Soma is, of course, the hallucinogenic drug that's freely distributed to everyone in all castes. 
and it provides everyone the ability to escape unhappiness or distress simply by giving them a sort of hallucination holiday without the effects. Uh, it keeps people from brooding, it keeps people from thinking, it keeps people from really doing anything except being high. The philosophical discussion that he leads is really a satire of the Sermon on the Mount from Mark 10. In fact, he even refers to Soma as having all the advantages of Christianity and alcohol with none of the defects. Uh, and this is something we've already talked about um, pretty heavily uh, throughout as we began this discussion. Ford and Freud sort of join to become God. That uh, Mon statement, Suffer the Little Children, is obviously a parody of Mark 10, uh, and Suffer the Little Children, you know, that was, uh, was spoken by Jesus. So in the, in, in the Elizabethan English of the King James Bible, suffer meant to permit or to allow. And so Mond is welcoming the children to him as if he's their savior, as well as being their teacher. Chapter four is really a transition to the plot uh, of the novel. It's, 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 we've really kind of taken on the, all the technology and that sort of speak that we've needed. And now the novel really starts its narrative component. Um, part one of this chapter yeah, really focuses on character development. Um, Lenina, we learn as a successful product of the conditioning process. And she truly believes that everyone belongs to everybody else. She's got no concept of the emotional triangle she has created for Bernard because of her actions with Henry Foster. She doesn't understand the existence of jealousy and emotional pain because there's always Selma to blank out those emotions. Bernard makes himself an outsider, but then he uses that actually to feed his resentment of being an outsider. So Bernard is an extremely complex character, and at the beginning of the novel, he seems kind of like our hero or our sort of uh, protagonist in some form. Um, yet, I don't know if we can make that case for it quite throughout. So it's something to be thinking about. Now, remember that Bernard Marx was being humiliated you know, beforehand as he was, you know, sitting there listening to um, Foster's talk about Lenina. So it continues in this chapter in his mind long after the Lenina and the onlookers have left. His, his humiliation continues with the whole incident here in chapter four, and he's even more harsh with lower caste workers. And they always remind him of his inadequate height and build. He carries sort of this mocking smile and remarks of others as his own personal baggage. Now, to compensate, he acts like a bully. He tries to fit in, and yet he always feels alienated. Likewise, Bernard feels his soulmate, Helmholtz Watson, is also similar to him. And he is. Uh, he, he has the same mental, mental uh, but not the same necessarily physical alienation from society, although he is still alienated in a physical way. Watson has all that a man could want. Uh, he has physical superiority. He has any female he chooses. He is excellent in sports. Both of these men, him and Bernard Marx, have this sort of vague feeling that something is missing in their lives, even though they have all the best their world can offer. Uh, Watson compares words to x-rays that can go through anything. They are perhaps what we would consider the romantics of the new world, searching for some kind of truth or beauty. Um, in chapter four, once again, uh, you have uh, Henry and Lenina, they fly over uh, on their way to the obstacle golf, and, and they're flying over these real suburban areas of London that would have been familiar to an English reader, uh, Shepherd's Bur uh, Bush, uh, was an inner city uh, area, and then others were middle class suburbs. Uh, Stokes Pegasus was a, a small country outside of London, um, a country town. Uh, so even futuristic fiction needs to give the reader some sense of reality and touches to the real world so that that reader can imagine what uh, what this world is like and what it can be and how it can be, you know, similar but yet different also to, to the world that exists. Uh, in chapter five, the community lit lives of Lenina and Bernard are described uh, throughout the chapter. Lenina has thoroughly enjoyed her golf game with Henry and thus the two have become responsible consumers of travel, country, and sports equipment. 
Uh, during their return ride to London, it's not the beauty of the sunset that attracts them, but rather the, the artificial lights from the buildings that are really the, the beautiful, attractive uh, things to them. Um, this new world uh, in chapter five, we realize is just as segregated as the old world. Lower caste live in barracks divided from the homes of alphas and betas by a wall. Uh, because of the genetic engineering and psychological condition, no one questions the differences in these accommodations, but dissatisfaction with one's place and discord between the haves and haves nots, even though it doesn't exist, there's really no basis for a class war revolution, but that doesn't prevent it from existing. What's interesting is that we really see this sort of come through the historical ideas. After all, in 1917, 15 years before the publication of this novel, the world witnessed, witnessed the Russian Revolution combined with the horror of World War I. Hopefully you're seeing Bernard Marx as being a illusion or elusive uh, character here uh, to maybe some real life connection. Uh, in the 1920s, England had high unemployment, strikes, overcrowding of the land, and obviously resulting social problems from that. Both England and the United States saw communist influences behind the strikes and social unrest. They called this the Red Scare. Some prominent writers and activists in both countries joined the Communist Party, seeing its doctrines of communal sharing of wealth as the hope for the world. Now, fear of the have-nots rising up against the upper classes then was very prevalent, even with the devil-may-care attitude of the Roaring Twenties in the United States. These problems had been solved in Huxley's New World, but at a price. There still was not equality. There's still class difference, just no war to accompany it. So since birth in chapter five is a scientific event and not an emotional one, so is death. And so you have this, this section of the crematorium that's written about where they fly over it. And the crematorium is a factory, like any other factory, with the output of that factory. And the recovered chemicals being the most important thing. Lenina is not concerned by death because it too is only a scientific event to her with without emotional ties. Her only concern when, when they're talking about it is whether the upper and lower castes have the same chemical recovery rate. Why? Because it creates a sense of momentary fun when the helicopter rides the warm updraft, right? And, and oh, look, look, I can fly, float up faster here and it pushes up quicker there. And, and since there's, so, there's no emotional bonds formed in life, there's also no sense of loss in death. And we see that through Lenina and her um, only looking at the chemical trails as a way to uh, have fun or what their actual recovery rate is. Um, and then of course, yeah, close to the end here of chapter five, you have the solidarity service. Uh, and these are the days and they're necessary to reinforce an adult world what was instilled in the child, the, the idea of community, identity, and stability. And these adulterated religious symbolism carries through the sessions. There's the sign of the T in the session for Ford's Model T that has obviously replaced the sign of the cross. There's the solidarity groups. They're made up of 12 people, which is the same as the uh, number of disciples that Jesus had. The Soma tablets and Soma ice cream have replaced the bread and wine of the Christian communion. And all throughout the solidarity service, there's this religious-like fervor that's built up. There's this sort of traditional church ritual that's been blended with sort of the most eff effusive practices of various evangelical groups. Hymns, chanting, tribal dancing, they all lead to this final culmination of a sexual orgy instead of religious ecstasy. So as scientific as the, this new world is, as we read about the solidarity service, we, we recognize that there is this real deep-seated need for the mystic belief. This need has been guided into an evolution that incorporates conditioning necessary for the society. It's also an emotional cleansing that has taken place for everyone. But Bernard, right? Everybody but Bernard feels this way. In 1844, Karl Marx, just like Bernard Marx, stated that religion was the opiate of the people. Soma and sex have replaced religion, but it's still the opiate of the people, that which subdues and controls them. Just as people through the ages have questioned and felt unfulfilled by religion, Bernard feels the same emptiness after the solidarity group session. 
that's the first five chapters. That's a few things to be thinking about as you have read those chapters and sort of what's going on in the novel. I hope it's given you a bit of insight to some of the things that you have read, and uh, I will see you back here for the next five chapters soon.